Right, I was on mute like a noob. Sorry. Um, so I won't look at you because because presentation on a different screen. Don't don't feel offended. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the chapter opens with a Bechdel test, um, which is based on this cartoon here. Um, but but basically, it's about the lack of female representation in film or women representation in film. Um, and these are the three rules of the test. Um, a movie has to have at least two women in it. These two women talk to each other. And the last rule is they talk about something besides a man. So the question is, what percentage of all recent movies do you think passed the bachelor test? And then suppose we know that there are three friends um, of different types. There's a feminist who understands majority like strong woman characters, clueless who cannot recall any movie scene, and the optimist who um, thinks that there is good representation in most movies. So most would pass the vegetable test. And, and so it's, I guess, a similar exercise to what we saw in chapter three. Uh, if we let pi to take on a value somewhere between zero and one, and it denotes a known proportion of recent movies that pass the bachelor test, which kind of friend do you think matches to which kind of beta prior models? Any takers? Could kind of see from the, from the preview maybe. Probably not. <laughs> okay, well, I've I've done the exercise, but uh, we can like try like for example like the beta one one is like a uniform distribution. Mm -hmm. This is the same, so we can assume like this is the clueless one. This is the one that have less idea of whatever. Like Evan said, like it can be like ten percent. It can be ninety percent, and. 10% and 90% have the same probability according to this distribution. Mm -hmm. So I would think the beta one one is the clueless one. And the optimist is the one that think like most of the movies uh, um, pass the Bichtel test. So this is the 14 one, the one on the uh, let's say I, I never know like which right and left it is, but like my right. <laughs> and, and then at the middle one is probably like the feminist, I will call it like the realistic, realist one. <laughs> we think it's around like 30% of the movies. Like if you pick the mod or the min, it's probably around 30, maybe a bit more. Uh, of the pro of the movies are uh, past the mission test. That's it. Correct. That is correct. Um, so, so now we understand that different people can have different priors. Um, but now suppose that they all go watch some n number of movies. And if we let y be the random variable to describe the number of successes um, or movie passing the bachelor test in n independent trials, AKA number of movies, um, then the proportion of movies that pass the test, pi can be modeled by a binomial model. And so um, if we take into account the different priors, well, a prior, and then the data modeled by binomial model, and each friend has their own beta binomial model, which can be described by this equation. Um, so pi given uh, random variable y is observed by little y. This is the distribution. So the distribution, the posterior distribution. Um, takes into account data here in blue. This makes sense, okay, cool. So, so um, the questions that then we asked here, 
is to what extent will the different priors lead to three different conclusions about movies passing the Bechdel test? Oops, there's a typo. Uh, how might the sample size and the outcomes of a movie they collect influence this? And to what extent with the posterior understanding evolve as friends watch movies, more movies, and will the three friends ever converge in their beliefs about the representation of women in film? Yeah, so I guess we can keep this in mind as we move on. Um, uh, so I think uh, what Olivia was, was talking about earlier, sort of like described by this. So the more specific prior information we have about pi um, or proportion of movies that pass the Bachelor test, um, the lower the variability that we have in the prior, and so the more certainty we have. So, so here in this case, if we're going from <laughs> this end to this end, it's increasing certainty and also decreasing variability. And so when we talk about the the clueless person here, sort of like um, pi can take on all values with equal probability. So described by the stream from distribution, and this is also called a flat prior. And then something that's very strong, someone with very strong opinions was how I sort of pictured in my head is, is something with less variability and more certainty. Okay, so that's, that's what they call perhaps an informative prior. Um, and so if they all watched 20 movies and they find that 45% out of the 20 movies uh, pass the test, who do you think um, posterior will look most like the scale of likelihood? Any takers on this one? Um, I will rule out the optimist one, but I don't know between the clueless and the feminist. Anyone else? Erica, Brandon, Eric? Yeah, I would say feminist, um, but well, uh, similar to Olivier, I don't know what it means to like, be more similar because, um, yeah, for the clueless dis prior distribution, I can't tell if it like changes more compared to the feminist one. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> this is a big reveal. So they actually scaled this likelihood. So this is not supposed to be a perfect overlap, but the, the answer is that the clueless one actually matches, the clueless pride posterior matches the scaled likelihood the most. And um, so, so is this is the reason. So we can move on here. So the reason is this. Um, so we, we, from before, we know this is the posterior mean is, the, is sort of defined by this definition. And the clueless one had the most overlap because um, I guess of, these the posterior will reflect insights gained from data, yeah, because they didn't have much opinions to begin with. And, but whereas the feminists did have some opinion, I think. Um, and then, but this is not a very good explanation. <laughs> I think when we get to the next proof, it, it's more obvious, this one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there for now. Um, the answer is <laughs> is the clueless person. Um, oh, oh oh sorry. The, the, the moral of the story is also that the 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 optimists didn't change their position very much. 
So if we look here, he, the optimist still thinks actually a majority of the movies um, have good represents will pass the test. So have good representation um, even after data. Um, so yeah, these characters are different from the book. <laughs> um, So now we want to test out the next question that they were asking in the beginning of the chapter. Okay, so we have different priors leading to different posteriors given the same data. So what if we change the data input? Um, and so these three people all have the same prior, beta 14 one, like before. Okay, but he will watch 13 movies. He will watch 63 movies and he will watch 99 movies. Um, okay. And then the proportion of movies that pass the tests are the same around, all around 46%. So, how do you think the different sample sizes will affect the respective posteriors? It'll we'll probably affect the variance, larger sample size, lower variance because of more certainty. Correct, correct. Oh, yeah, I should have shown this. <laughs> so, yeah, as, 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 as Brandon said, um, so this Goku who watched 99 movies, he his posterior distribution ended up to be about 0.5, which is, is this the correct one? Yeah, yeah, yes. the, the, this okay, is okay. smaller. The, the size of the bell is, is smaller, so it's, it's uh, of less certainty. It have, it's yes. more certain, like it's more res, um, concise, I don't know. Right, more certain and less variability. Yes, so 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 you can see it by how how narrow the, the 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 likelihood is. So this likelihood here is very wide. Um, so compared to this likelihood here, so I guess then the input to influence the posterior is more if you have more data. Um, and and so I guess this this leads us to what we were already thinking um, the proportion of movies um, passing a batch cell test remain constant whilst the number of movies increasing from 13 to 99 the data's influence over posterior increases and and so also um, the priors influence decreases um, on the other hand if you hold the sample size constant, the more informative the prior, the greater its influence on the posterior. So, um, yeah, if we go back to the, the first scenario of going down the, this column here, this is sort of the optimist and the feminist and the clueless person. And, and, and so I guess the, the moral of the story here is the, as basically if they all watch enough movies, they'll all converge on like a similar posterior mean. Um, and this was the, the math where the, the posterior mean, as we saw before, it can be expressed by this and then they simplify. I don't know how we want to go through this, but basically A plus Y over that is broken up into two separate terms, so equivalent, and then they multiply each of the term by one, basically, but sort of like trick it into decomposing it um, into a private and data bit. So uh, eventually, then, then we, we move this data over to the left. So what does this look like? This looks like, what do we know? The prior means formulation. 
And over here, if we swap this over, we'll have something that looks like um, this is basically what, oops, what we get from the data, y over n. So number of successes divided by number of movies. And, and so the posterior mean um, is basically a, a weighted sum of the prior mean and the observed data. Um, and these weights sum to one. And, um, and this, this was the intuition that they tried to get us before, or give us before, which was um, as the sample size increases, the weight of the prior model or how the prior influences the posterior mean um, decreases, as we can see from the first term. And then on the other hand, as n increases, the weight of the data sort of goes, um, approaches one. And so at the end of the day, the posterior mean actually approaches the data um, as we get more and more sample size. Um, and this is a worked example you can go through in the book. Uh, let's see. Um, and then section 4.4 then goes on to talk about sequential analysis, which is where posterior model is updated incrementally as more data come in uh, with each piece of data, the previous posterior model reflecting on the standing of the prior to observe observing this data becomes a new prior model. Um, and then, and this sort of like makes sense from a scientific perspective, right? If we're doing an experiment in a lab or something, and then we start with a sample size of five rats, and then we observe some mean of the of like some biomarker, and then we do another round of experiment with ten rats this time. Uh, we want to be able to improve what we observed this time upon last time, right? And not take it as like independent experiments. So so um, the the Chaps's example, we go back to Milgram's experiment from before where the psychologists um, test if people will shock other people. Um, but they, they want us to think about also collecting this data incrementally over three days. Um, and, and so this is represented like this uh, as a plot, but so on day zero, we have no data. and they had this prior, prior where they think people are generally good and won't actually shock people, as you can see from this prior distribution in yellow. Um, and then on day one, he experimented on 10 people and one out of 10 shocked somebody. And then updated, use and updated this prior with this data which became this posterior. And then on day two, he did an experiment with 20 people. And then now this time 17 people shot somebody. And so now on day two, he uses day one's posterior model as day two's prior model. And then using this data, updated it to day two's posterior model and so on for day three. Um, and Doing sort of the sequential analysis, or sequential Bayesian analysis, aka Bayesian learning, um, it has two fundamental properties. The first is that the final posterior model is data order invariant, and what that means is if, like, if you if you observed day two's data on day one and day one's data on day two, the posterior mean on day three will still be the same. Um, and then second property is that the final posterior only depends upon the cumulative data. Um, uh, so I think this is, if you sum it all together, instead of doing it incrementally, you will also get to the same posterior mean. And I got lazy at this point and didn't copy and paste more things. So um, in 4.5, <laughs> 
you can <laughs> you can go go through the proof of, of of checking that these two properties are true but but these two properties are very handy to have um and then section 4.6 is titled don't be stubborn and again an example of an extremely stubborn model is where um a prior a prior probability of zero is assigned to certain params of values and using again the same Mogram experiment with a very stubborn researcher. He has a prior of um, on, on the proportion of people who might uh, shock others. Um, uniform prior uh, between zero and 0.25. So he thinks is equally likely for people to shock other people between zero and 0.25. But then over here, he thinks it's impossible. No one, no one, oops, would ever do that. Um, and, and, and yeah, I don't know why this is here, but I, I guess this is, this yellow thing is the illustration of the probability, probability density function of this uniform prior. Um, so we have this prior, and then the researcher um, did an experiment and was told that eight out of 10 people delivered a shock to other people. Um, what do you think the posterior will look like? A or B or C? Give another prior it, I... Yeah. So, someone go for it. I know the answer. <laughs> I don't think there is trick. Okay, I will go if no one wants to go. <laughs> I will go with C. Well, Eric was going. How oh, is it? Go, Eric. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I will say that I was going with C, and then you can define a beta distribution whether you think that was true or, or not. Uh, no, but uh, the way I think about it, if the prior is uniform from 0 to 0 0.25, then all, all possibilities uh, over 0 0.25, they're uh, impossible, right? And it doesn't matter how much uh data you throw at it yeah that's it that, that is indeed the correct concept <laughs> so um the posterior model can only be defined on the same values for which the prior model is defined so if the prior model says this section is undefined then we get the same as posterior um so so what this also means is even if he shocks, I don't know, 10,000 people, it doesn't matter. Like it will not inform anything here. <laughs> so I mean, the, 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 red, the green curve will probably go stronger on the 25%. It will probably sure. like this, it's probably yeah. shrink more to the 25%, to the, um, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah, it will not grow will outside here. of it. Yeah. Yep. One stuff that I have trouble like reading their plot is that they don't scale them. They're, so like the first two are on the same scale and the C1 is not on the same scale on the densities. So uh, yeah. the, this is maybe sometimes like this trouble people. I mean, I had, I had a bit of trouble with them like because like the C, like obviously the posterior is more confident than the 25% because like <laughs> but it's obviously a bad model. Right. That's... Right. So, so I modeled the title to be don't be a Bayesian and be stubborn because <laughs> silly. Either be a Bayesian or be stubborn. Um, so then I think then the chapter sort of closes on answering these four questions uh, based on 
some commonly passed around critiques of um, the Bayesian paradigm versus the frequentist paradigm. Um, so the first one, true or false, all prior choices are informative. I mean, we're five, so we can, each of us can take one. Yes. Okay, Olivia, go first. Um, well, I guess this display on the definition of what they mean by informative. And I think like a uniform prior doesn't count as something informative. Because like we uh, um, give uh, every option the same probability. So this doesn't provide any kind of inform more information on one part or another part. So some prior are not, cannot, are not informative. So we'll go with false. Okay, that is a correct answer. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, uh, next person. Next question. There may be good reasons for having an informative prior. Federica. <laughs> there may be good reason for having an informative prior. I think uh, it's true. True. Yes, exactly. It yeah. was sort of like what we're saying. We build on experiments and previous observations. We, yeah, we should have better priors. It's science. Okay, cool. like, exactly. You can know something before, like, I don't know. <laughs> Some... Yeah. Yeah, if, if we got informative prior, so we have good information to predict for the posterior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. right, number three. Any prior charts can be overcome by enough data. Eric. Uh, yeah, I guess we saw that uh, like if the prior is limited so that there's zero probability in the space where probability space where the likelihood is, the prior will not be influenced by the likelihood. Uh, is that a fair way to, to put it? Like the previous example, the zero to zero 75 uniform prior. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I would say false. Correct. Okay. Last one. Frequentist paradigm is totally objective. Brendan. Um, I'll have to say false just on principle. I don't know if any <laughs> paradigm's objective. <laughs> no, that that is that, that is a fair answer. Yeah, yeah. It's like when it's it was always confusing to me when 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 like we have to do power calculations on an experiment. Um, we have to assume some sort of mean to calculate what sample size is required. Where does that mean come from? For sure. Not objective, I, uh, right? Yeah. yeah, there's no way to come up with a good effect size in the power analysis is what I've learned. Yeah, so that is also false. Cool. We are at the end of my presentation. <laughs> question? Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, super, super good presentation. Uh, the frequency paradigm is totally objective. Uh, I mean, was there any, because all the, Previous three, like I remember, like how you could, like you know, re read the chapter and you can argue for or against them, right? But was there anything on the ob objectivity in this chapter that, that I missed reading, or uh, on specifically the frequentist or about Bayesians? Uh, I mean, it, essentially, like uh, like remembering what I remember from reading the chapter. Like mm -hmm. I think the one, two, and three, I can see how they tied to 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 what I remember reading. But is there a part of the of the chapter where they discuss this frequentist paradigm not being uh, uh, objective? Because I don't remember reading uh, such a such a part. But but uh, yeah, I mean, oh, it's just I one paragraph. Yeah, it's one just one paragraph, and it was just, I guess, about doing science in general. So it was like no single paradigm can be totally objective. So the general critique of Bayesians just being subjective and not. And so not as objective as, as frequent is, is probably just bogus. Um, and, and this sort of ties back into number two is like, okay, you might, you might be subjective, but your subjectivity might be based on data. And then would, <laughs> would you consider that objective or subjective? Um, and, and, and so there, yeah, I, I think that sort of, it's just in general and talks about that um yeah so okay so essentially except from the 4.7 yeah they didn't really discuss it okay well then good well, thanks for the way i remember them okay well uh i will i will just like 
had one stuff like I really like it. Uh, I mean, I don't. I mean, the Bayesian, um, uh, uh, I don't remember like Bayesian analysis or update learning. I don't remember the exact term of it. But the fact that because we are working with the full distribution, even if you have more data times the full distribution, more data times the full distribution, et cetera, et cetera, you get the same result at the end. This is something that I found very nice. <laughs> because if you work like, let's say you, let's say if I have done hypothesis testing, between like, for example, my, um, the let's if we, if we go like with the, um, I don't remember the name of the shocking uh, experiment, uh, but like if, if, I, if I was here and every time I collect data, I'm making a, a new hypothesis, then I try to test against, uh, against it. And I will probably have like, I will not be able like, to do that, like I will have like, let's say a result on day one, then a result on day three, two, and then the result on day three. I don't know if I could have been able to get, uh, because I, I'm not working with the full distribution every time. Like I'm just getting like some, working with the mean or some kind of, of stuff like that or rank. So I will, uh, this is something that I really like it. The idea like, because you are working with distribution, uh, as a, like you can have it sequentially or like in total will provide you the same results. I think this is very neat, but that was <laughs> just an appreciation, of me. not a question, just something like cool. And that's it. But yeah, it's because you have the full distribution, so you can still multiply it. Much you don't is lose how, yeah. You don't lose information basically by using a mean or rank. Uh, while you're using tests, basically you are losing information to to go quicker on the calculation, I guess. So yeah. <laughs> so Frederick, I sorry I interrupt you. Well, just just uh, thinking about how do. You you need to, on first principle, be able to uh, identify the distribution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with hypothesis testing, you just making hypothesis that the data uh, are within a certain range. So you are set the threshold and decide to accept it or not. Why with this case, I think this, this is, is the, um, so the discussion is, it's not a matter of which one of the two is better, but if you can apply the Bayesian more than the yeah, hypothesis testing, based on data, based on what, on your knowledge about the data, if you know the distribution, do you know the distribution? You know that, that that's a beta, that's a beta distribution. Uh, on first principles, I say, I mean, uh, you need to be able to, so you, if you know historical data, you know that that phenomenon, I don't know, what are you analyzing? <laughs> that, that, that's that's the, the thing. So you need to, it, it, it by cases, uh, it changes by cases. Uh, I think the beta distribution is very nice because it's a uh, one that goes zero to one. So it's basically fits every kind of stuff like you want to fit probability. Uh, the, I think the picking a model for the data, like the binomial one, like because like we are saying, it's a binomial um, distribution behind it. I think this is the part that is a bit harder. I think uh, filling a distribution for the... Um, the prior is usually easier, I feel, than the data on my experience. Like I work a lot with um, with uh, count of events. So it's it's usually, yeah, if you take a book, they will say uh, Poisson distribution, distribution, sorry. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is a bad distribution if you have a lot of zero or if you have extreme value. 
which happen a lot when you are counting stuff, like depend on what you are counting. I'm counting three. But if people are counting like stuff where you have like, for example, a huge excess of something, the po uh, Poisson distribution will totally fail at it. But this is something that I think you need to learn uh, reading books and doing exercise and practicing. So I, I, I think it's a it's fair point saying like, yeah, doing tests, you don't need to know. You can just apply the test and do like the, I don't know, like the um, check uh, if the result of the test uh, is, you can use it or not. But uh, that's why we are reading the book, trying to improve. But I, I don't think like this is particularly Bayesian. I think even in frequentist, you can use distribution and just do the math. I think this is not exactly 100% Bayesian. I will not argue that. I'm not confident to, <laughs> to this point, <laughs> to say like, this is this. But uh, yeah, this was, um, I will say like this uh, update learning was nice. Uh, whether it's Bayesian or not, I'm not, I don't think I'm qualified to, to rule it out or not. I don't know what others think about that. But. Um, I have a question about uniform distribution. So the way at least I originally understood it is that frequentist analyses were always equivalent to Bayesian analyses with the uniform um, prior or like um, non-diffuse or non-informative prior, or is that- No, not Gaussian, Gaussian. Yeah, a typical linear regression is the Gaussian um, model. So you have like used the, um, not the uniform, you use the, um, what's the name of the Gaussian? What's the name? Normal. The Normal, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. So it depends some, some of, I, I, I don't know all the distribution, but I think like, uh, obviously like linear regression, the basic one is normal distribution as a way to approximate the mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. Okay, I'll think about that. Because, um, uh, you know, when I think about the argument for frequent as being objective, um, it's people would say that it's because, um, you know, it doesn't come with the prior. And I, I associate that with just being a non-formative uniform distribution where each outcome could be, is just as plausible. So that's where I was coming from. Um, if you're saying it's equivalent to a Gaussian or normal prior or normal distribution as a prior, then, then I'm not sure. Doesn't frequentist and Bayesian stats answer typically different questions? Isn't a typical example, uh, uh, if the food is tasty, uh, what's the probability that you smile while the patient would be conditioning on that the fact that you're smiling was the probability of the food being tasty. Right. There are... I agree with that. One fixes, one treats the data as fixed and the parameters as random and then it's vice versa for the other school. Um, yeah, I just thought you could reparameterize one into the other, if that makes sense. Um, I think Richard McElreath may have talked about that at one point, but I'll have to review. Um, both I think you can do that. I think you can definitely do that. But uh, I mean, if we are speaking just like, like let's say the linear regression model, like just uh, y equal uh, an intercept plus a, a slope times um, some, um, some coefficient we try to estimate it. Uh, we can like, you can probably do a Bayesian version and, uh, and behind the same model, like, the beta, I'm pretty sure we can find frequency states for the beta uh, binomial model probably exists and someone have like created a test, but I think Eric is right saying like the question may be uh, framed differently. But I, mechanically, uh, I think you are also right saying like we can probably like put them, to, I mean, reuse them together because they use distribution at some points and simplification at some other points. So. But uh, at some of the, at some point, I think like as well that yeah, they use distribution, but maybe they just take the mean or summarize the distribution and not work with all the distribution for like convenience stuff. I think I don't know. We can recheck Richard Michael Reds. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. what's the name? Yes. 
if you find the section where, where he mentions that, I'd be uh, super happy to read it. So, so please share if you if you do find it. Yeah, sure. I will check my notes also, but uh, I don't think like anyway. <laughs> Other question? Are we good? We, we have to set up to do some exercise at one time. I haven't done it, but next time I promise you some exercise. I think it's important um, to practice some uh, at least. Uh, the code for the moment is pretty easy. I don't think like, uh, I don't know how you feel or how confident you are. I'm not a huge tidy vert expert, so I learn a lot. But it's still easy. Like it's not like uh, nothing like to nothing. It's too hard. Um, but the simulation can be a bit harder. So I will I will like a lot of time. I'm thinking it will be easier to produce list instead of data frame and and work on. But um, yeah, this is just different. So next time maybe we can do a bit of exercise if we have time. So I will I will I will present next time because like Eric uh, is doing an holiday. Is it right? <laughs> uh, oh, no, meeting. I, I, I have a I have a thing, yes. Uh, okay, so good excuse, good excuses. So I will be presenting. <laughs> Hopefully it will be not too bad. And uh, we will set up some some exercise. At least I would like us to to try a bit simulate simulated data because I think it's very uh, this is some things that I learned from uh, Richard McElroy. And I'm trying to apply way more in my practice is doing sim synthetic data to um, to test uh, because what we are doing now is it's very easy. I mean, we we don't even need to calculate; can just use the conjugate families and 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 use the equation, and we get the posterior distribution. And we don't have too much parameter; we just have one variable we try to explain. But the harder the model is, I think better. Uh, is to have like some kind of um, way to protect yourself from doing errors on the analysis part. And I think the synthetic data, synthetic simula simulation help a lot doing that. So next time we do it, be ready. <laughs> okay. Well, if it's good, I hope you a nice weekend. Nice holiday, Eric. Uh, nice summer holiday. And see you next week. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.